Skipping ain't easy, but it's necessary. I be getting weary, cause shit be getting scary. But sit back, relax, and don't you dare worry. Cause I be hitting wrongs with a righteous fury. Yes, sir, see, I am the only one. My name is Josh Dunn, gonna have some fun. Telling the truth, y'all can't handle. I might raise a scandal as I dismantle. The fake make them quake and make them shake. I make you bend, but never will I make you break. Just chill, yo, and don't be frightened. Open that closed mind, it's time to get in light. Folks, welcome to our very biggest milestone episode of all time. Gimpin' ain't easy because it ain't episode number 25. We have got uh, no sponsors uh, this week because everything is shut down due to the coronavirus. So I hope our one day eventual sponsor will be the vaccine to the coronavirus. Stop making us sick, you prick. Look, I don't think it gets any more significant at this point number wise till episode number 50 and uh, as as a result we have a really milestone guest lined up Canadian television legend she's killed real dragons and eats her peas with a fork it's Kathy Jones and I'm really jealous about that peas with a fork bit because those of you who've broken bread with me know that I can only eat with a spoon that's everything everything with a spoon even my juice that's right, folks. If I can pretend it's medicine, I can pretend I'm happier. I'm really excited to do this episode because we'll talk about Kathy's career, but what makes it special to me is the chance to get Kathy's take on life. The goal I've always had for this show is to make an impact on people, and if that goal is ever realized, to make the world a better place, even if only slightly. Hope to interview her in a way that she never has been before and have a great conversation while we do. Guys, these are special times, you know, we're in a pandemic the likes of which has not been seen in our lifetimes in our part of the world. I think this is something not to be taken lightly, but we really shouldn't panic. Uh, I think we should still get fresh air and some of you might oppose me on this, but I think that meetups with a very small numbers like close, close friends and family are, are not really a bad idea. Um, there's a large part of me also that's relieved that if we must endure a global catastrophe, that it be coronavirus as opposed to, say, nuclear war, an unthinkable natural disaster like asteroid took out the dinosaurs, or like, you know, everybody clinging on to debris in the water because of a massive flood, or like complete world famine. And please understand, by saying this, I, I don't mean to lessen the tragedies that have taken place from this horrible virus or the billions of lives that are in crisis every day with or without coronavirus, but I think things could be a lot worse. I think we got to remain calm, be tender and forgiving, and become our best selves as we face this crisis together. My greatest hope is that from this pandemic, we learn what is really important in life, how precious and fragile it can be and ultimately, that we can create a better world for everyone. Okay, folks, here we are with episode 25 and our very special guest this evening, the one and only, like I said in the intro, Dragon Slayer, and she eats her peas with a fork. It's Canadian television legend, <coughs> Kathy Jones. How are you, Kathy? Hey! Oh my God, that is so sweet. I was just out with my grandson walking and he was. we were talking about how legendary, we were doing all kinds of foolish pretend Shakespearean stuff and then he was saying that I was legendary and I was you know striking a pose we were we were approximating Shakespearean language by using a lot of lisping actually it wasn't really we weren't doing very well yeah I am um, I I was uh I was only a very young man back in the 1600s so I don't remember if Shakespeare lisped or not or <laughs> uh, you, you are super funny I love you. And uh, so, so are you. Thank you. Yeah. No, this is so, so, um, how, how are, like, how are you, how are you faring in this coronavirus thing? Like how, how, how are you doing? Well, you know, I, I do, I have always been a person that, uh, you know, does the minimum amount of work. Uh, and so that's why I've clung to the, the 22 minutes shift for 27 years. And then from March, you know, whatever to September, when they say we have to go back, I basically am like, you know, pretty much committed to fucking around. 
And I've been doing that for my whole life. So, and I spend a lot of time alone. It used to confound me, but, uh, but I really came to, as I, you know, as I healed various, you know, uh, like potholes where I would fall down and feel completely impoverished because I didn't have, you know, 17 friends that did something together every weekend and realized how much solitude there was in my life as I became more uh, aware of how introverted I actually am mm. and how much I love being alone. That's um, that's really interesting because I, I am uh, extremely introverted as well. And I, I, I didn't um, know that about you because I think so much of like your your public persona right has to be so large that you know it's it sometimes um you know what what what's what's it like when when folks aren't paying attention they just might not have any idea mm-hmm. well you know like um i i for for the fact that i'm on television in canada since 1986 i get i i actually keep a pretty low profile and you know i've never been you know i'm not I'm not actually I'm coming to terms with my own kind of like I have ambition to get my writing out and to, you know, finish something, but I have ADHD or ADD. And so I've had a lot of struggles over the years, needed an assistant and karmically and personality wise have had a hard time making that, uh, that relationship. So I don't have that person who's like here every day named Joanne or something who helps me to make sure that I stay on track. So this whole COVID thing is giving me such a massive amount of space that I'm actually like have the time and the space to go, oh, yeah, maybe a schedule would be good, you know. Right. And and so this morning, for example, after letting Mary write all the Mrs. E's and take my character and put her words in its mouth. This morning, I had kind of a, a set to with her and said, I have things that I want to say that I don't want Mary's lines. I want to be able to represent my character and say the things that mean something to me. Like I wanted to talk about immunity and masks and vitamin C and things that are important to me in that character without just being, you know, the mouthpiece for whatever she wants to say. And so it was a little bit challenging this morning, but actually I kind of like, sat down there and wrote a sketch. That's why I gave myself permission to fuck off completely and get stoned and go to Costco and spend 600 bucks. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, But, but, you know, yeah, I, I always, yeah. So, you know, I feel like I, I do keep a low profile and I haven't, I feel like people say, you know, like successful and I'm like, not really because until I get those books out that I want to write and until I, you know, have that like this is a Kathy Jones joint, as they say. Like until that's on something, I'm not really going to be satisfied. But at the same time, I've come to terms with if that never happens, I'm still really enjoying my life. You know, right? Yeah, um, I I think um, the the projects that are that are most dear to us are sometimes uh, the hardest to pull off. But I totally like how you're saying about how you know with this with the space and time like with, and and so much less going on like even with the ADD and stuff like maybe you you have enough time and space to be become like your own Joanne right now right my own Joanne you're that assistant that was going to Oh gonna, yes yeah, no exactly yeah, exactly yeah, like yeah. I I have I I just discovered that when I did some work with this guy in town named Declan King in December I did in I did this work with him where he would he does this thing of freeing up um, physical manifestations of held stress in your abdominal and your organs and stuff. And after he did that work, I let go of this overwrought kind of overpressured and burdened kind of vibe of like, oh my god, the Jamaicans need more money and I've got to give it to them. And instead, I found my solar plexus and I found this strength. And I was able to say to the crazy parts of me that want to run around and freak out, I said, listen, mom's got work to do right now. You guys are just going to have to calm down. So I found this confidence in my gut. And I feel like I forget it sometimes and I fall apart and lack confidence. But if I keep on pounding my head against the wall, I just, you know, I know that I can prove to myself that it's difficult, but it's doable. And, and you know, it, it really is about how you frame it with your brain on a minute to minute basis. 
Yeah, I know it's interesting, like how much our, our our bodies are connected to that, and you know when that stuff gets out of whack, and we do become overstressed and overwrought, and those kind of things that we um that that like it all just sort of falls apart and fucks up. But I think, like you said, yeah. just sort of keep at it, you know, and and go at it with them. So, but like, how do how do you? How, like I'm curious how you feel about um like like in in terms of the virus are like do you think uh we as like Canadian are we are we like taking this seriously enough are we are we taking it too seriously are 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 we like how what's what's your kind of sense of how like the average Brit do you think do you think it's like right on or well you know um when when you hone in on the question of how we're doing yeah. and and think of that as a tight fist holding the question and then you open up the fist and it opens and opens and opens. And I, I have a, I'm, I've been thinking about these days since the seventies when I knew that this couldn't, the, you know, the sensor cannot hold this, this fucking thing can't, this is going to get bad. It's going to get bad because it's going to get fucked up. I didn't know how fucked up it was going to get, you know, and still be able to stay in your house and have a snack. I mean, I thought, you know, we always think it's going to be much more raw than this, but it, it is, happening and what i feel is is the whole immune system of the world is broken down and that people don't understand immunity and people don't discuss immunity it's almost taboo and it's it's the realm of the hippie and you know and and there's no respect for the view that we can achieve uh, and hold a uh, greater immunity but people have been approaching uh, overall health uh you know, the medical association, the medical, uh, you know, the typical medical allopathic kind of medicine doesn't approach health in, it's always been about illness and, and disease, and it hasn't been about health. And so coming from my background of since my 20s, and now I'm 65, uh, we were Rastas at first. We, we found out about the vegetarian uh, uh, ITAL diet from a, a Rasta in Jamaica in the 70s, and then we were you know, I was face and eyes into herbs and fasting and all that stuff and have studied all this stuff all these years. And, you know, even though I've been a sugar freak and I've, you know, not been as healthy and I've struggled a lot with my health, I've, I've never given up. And I really had a great discussion yesterday with this woman about the three branches of the immune system and how we blow them out. And I feel like what we are missing in this country and what, what we're, we cannot get access to is beyond the pharmaceutical um, companies' uh, iron grip on our information about achieving immunity. Uh, for example, vitamin C and intravenous vitamin C ha is being tested all over the world. China, China is suggesting people do 5,000 mg of vitamin C right now. Wow. You know, pe people are not. The intravenous vitamin C is incredibly toxic to viruses and cancer. There's all kinds of like alternative things. And also just the basic health of the immune system, especially in older people, is very compromised because most older people my age and older are on several pharmaceutical drugs, which are like from antidepressants to uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And all of these things are knocking out the the microbiome, which is the, you know, the guardian at the gate to uh, keep you from being so inflamed. And what these people are dying of, who are dying of COVID, they've knocked out two really important parts of their immune system, and they're left with just the part that can get inflammation. And so they, they're basically, you know, dying of inflammation. And I, I'm unfortunately, and I don't think I'm a conspiracy theorist, but I'm also very strongly of the minds and of the, uh, I share the opinion and the expertise of Dr. Thomas Cowan, who says that radiation is harmful to the human cell and we are just amping it up and amping it up and that each, each epidemic pandemic that's happened over the last like 150 years has coincided with the release of new technology that's got um, more of a buzz to it and more of a toxic kind of, you know, dangerous to the human. And, and so in a way, we're at the same time that right now we're experiencing this beautiful kind of slowing down and appreciation kind of vibe. I feel like the, the evil in the world is getting blue balls wanting to get back to the destruction as quickly as they can. And that my thought today was that 
when it snaps back, they may knock the whole thing out of whack, and it could be quite heavy when when it when we're released again. You know, to to do the bullshit materialistic, you know, crazy toxic, you know, usual song and dance. Well, so I have no, nothing to say about that. Well, I, I mean, if if it's up to me, the evil of the world gets uh, the blue balls get so bad they just shrivel up and fuck off. You know, that would be my <laughs> my ideal, right? But um, so so I so I think like to, uh, if 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 I'm if I'm hearing you right, it's kind of like the fact that um, we are we are not you know living to our to our you know we don't have the health options often or or knowledge to live to our bodies like um, natural. Um, capacity yeah. for healing and health, and and if we were, perhaps these um, these pandemics and things of that nature would be much lessened, and 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 we we are sick like this because we are we are sick as a as a society as well, right? Yes, yes, definitely, and as a planet, and and they're they can't wait to get back to it, like the like the the pollution, like my friend Ken has invented this thing called Zero Emissions Day, Ken Wallace. And, and like zero emissions day is a dream. Like, how are we going to get them to stop flying planes? 9-11, they stopped for a couple of days. How are we going to get them to stop flying planes and, and, and shooting out those uh, cruise ships? And how are we going to cut the traffic and cut down the pollution and clear things? How are we going to do that, guys? Oh, pandemic. You know, when, from the beginning in the early March, I went, hey, maybe this coronavirus is Miley Cyrus. Maybe this is going to slow down the fucking installation of 5G. Like I'm, I'm here thinking, should I become a major fucking throw, throw my life to the wind activist and go and try to get through to to Trudeau and say, do we really have to take this shit so we can have talking posters and self-driving fucking cars? You idiot. Like all of us, like right now we have smart meters that are fucking, everyone's getting like headaches, can't sleep, blah, blah, blah. We're all fucking, and we are paying through the nose. So there's a lot of evil in the world outside of the imbalance that we've created with spraying the forest so all the hardwood doesn't grow anymore. We're just, we've, we have thrown... Listen, I want to do a big minute about it. Like, live by the dick, we're going to die by the dick. And it's just been run by these asshole men for so long that men, and I just think like, can we just switch it up? We're talking about moving to another planet? That's how, that's how much you want to trash this place? Get the fuck out! I have had it with the fucking men leading things. I think you're right. I think we absolutely need a more uh, nurturing approach to uh, to rulership, you know. And and uh, I think I think you raise a really good point too, because like you know, with all this great technology and whatever, like uh, what what the fuck good is it if you can you know you have a flying jetpack but you can't breathe, you know? Like, oh yeah, and, and you know, like how come fucking Elon Musk doesn't have to go? I kept saying on twenty two minutes. Can we have Elon Musk coming into an office and having you talk to Mildred about filling out these forms to get permission to put 35,000 satellites into fucking space? Why are these people allowed to do whatever the fuck they want and charge us four or more for it? So that it's basically, why are we letting these thugs ruin life on Earth? Yeah, I, um, I think, I think things get, get, run in so deep and so, you know like the average person um doesn't either have the knowledge or the capability to change but i i, I hope my hope is things like this and 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 talking about this that the people do pay attention and and that you know we we do start thinking about things in a different way and can can be can be helpful because uh you're, you're right it, it's 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 very corrupt at the top and it, it seems to get worse every year but also anybody yeah and anybody that brings up anything is like oh you fucking hippie what are you anti-vaxxer are you and the fact is vaccines have faults and here's one of the faults of vaccines is that they do not they do not provoke an immune reaction unless they have an adjuvant or uh, an, an additive that creates an irritation in the system. And the only way they can get that thing, that, that reaction from the immune system, which doesn't really create immunity, it, it constantly has to be amped up. It, it, they put in something like aluminum or mercury, and they do. They put in something irritating. So, like, I mean, say what you will and think, oh, you, you know, you're such an anti-vaxxer. And it's like anti-vaxxer, anti-schmaxer. There's a way to fucking achieve immunity. And we don't have to just, like people say, oh, they wouldn't do that. And I think they, what the fuck do you think? Who is they? 
that you think is not going to do this. Like, they wouldn't put that in the water. It's like they, at this point, is leaning back, getting a fucking blowjob from a robot, and wearing an eye patch. Like, they is a fucking corrupt motherfucker. Yeah, th- they is a, 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 a very successful and, and, and uh, fucked up, corrupt pirate from the sounds of things. I, I he um, is. Yeah, I... And I think I think that's a really cool point too. Like how you like, it's so it's so messed up. How like, well, to make you well, we got to make you a little sick first, right? Like that whole formula, you know. That's oh yeah. And if and if and if you have, it's all about the load, Josh. I mean, I didn't. I know you don't know that I'm in, this into like health and stuff, but you have to consider the load, the inherent weakness that this person's body may have the inherited, you know, uh, a, a compromised immune system from birth, the, uh, the, uh, the environment and how it, it is impacting that person, the amount of the weakness of their system, they may have, you know, toxic uh, uh, bacteria and parasites. They may be the person that is going to not be able to take that extra shot when they get their vaccine, like my daughter, when she gives her kids vaccines, because it's the law, she, she also goes, okay, look, since he's 12 pounds, how about we just do one this week and one in a couple of weeks? Because what they do now is they, he's here, we might as well give him his hip kit and find him. And they fucking load these things into the kids and let the chips fall where they may. You can't count on everybody to have a fucking tip top fucking system that can handle this load. Yeah. It's about the load. It's the overall load. Load from radiation, load from cell phones, load from the toxic food, load from, you know. And so vaccines are not fucking, you know, they don't get the fucking gold star. I'm sick of it. I'm sorry. I'm a nut. I'm sorry. I'm a, you know, I see, I'm saying I'm a nut because that's the way people treat people like me that were anti-vaxxer and shit like that. I'm not anti-vaxxer. I just feel like we should consider the load and we have to be careful. Yeah, I I think it's really important that like um you know one one size does not necessarily fit all, right? Yes. So that's yes. I think that's the right way to look at that, and uh, don't don't feel bad about being a nut because I I spent uh, Christmas twenty eighteen in the mental hospital, so but I'm right. out, I'm out now, so uh, I'm yeah um, presumably that's better. Good. I guess. Congratulations! So, yeah, that thank great, you. It takes great skill to get out of there. It sure does. It's, uh, yeah, once you're there, you don't know how it's going to work, but, um, you really don't, but, but, um, no. I, I, so I want to focus just a little more on you now and you're, you're like, er, like, so I'm pretty sure you were born in Newfoundland. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I yeah. got that right. At least so. Okay. So what, so what was like life for early Kathy Jones, like in, in Newfoundland, early life and childhood, what was that kind of trip? Well, I was just writing this because I'm trying to write about my mom right now because, you know, um, I'm trying to write about why, you know, why I've struggled with my mental stuff uh, and what it was like to grow up with a mother that was hilarious and wonderful and, and magnetic, but also kind of having a prolonged panic attack. But when I was a little child, before I went to school, I was, uh, you know, out. We were allowed to be out, of course. So in 1955, uh, by 1959, I was, you know, I had, I could go out like a lot. And then, you know, in the, between 55 and and 60, before I went to school and in the summers and stuff, I spent a lot of time outside. And and then there was a lot of bullfrogs and, and caterpillars and butterflies and moths and bugs and dandy long legs and ants and, you know, many, 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 many kind of like wild, you know, so I was faced, my face was close to nature all the time, like popping these little, you know, popping those little bubbles of sap on sticks. And, you know, like I was outside, we lived by a river uh, called Rennie's River in St. John's. And even though there was a sign on the river that said you could get polio if you swam there, because it was, it was in the fifties when polio was, uh, you know, was the, the scourge people were getting polio, but like, we, my father was a distributor of films. He had a store where he did photo finishing of uh, film, and he also rented out films like you would from a video store, except there were the actual film reels. The film reels, yeah. In the, yeah, so in the basement, my uncle, with a cigarette in his mouth, 
was slicing the films in the basement of my dad's place over in Churchill Square. And, you know, my father would go on the radio and he would go around to the outports with a projector and a screen and a film and, and screen a film in a small community. And then he would go on the radio and he would say what films were playing around at different places. And he'd do this little pretend interview with Bing Crosby, for example, because there'd be a, uh, an actual LP, a record with an interview of Bill Crosby. Bill, Bill, Bing Crosby. Bill, Bing Crosby. So my dad would say, you know, hey, you know, how was it appearing with Jane, somebody in this film? And then he would play the record so it sounded like my dad was really interviewing the guy. That's amazing. And then, and then, I know. And then my father would say, you know, this is Michael Jones reminding you that tonight and every night the show must go on and stuff like that, right? So that's pretty cool. And, you know, my parents were both super duper funny. Uh, my father was very dry and my mother was very, you know, hysterically funny. And, uh, you know, my father was an alcoholic who didn't start drinking until I was about 11. And around the same time, my mother's panic attack, you know, became crippling. She had agoraphobia. So she had to wear sunglasses when she went out. And we had to go to the church up on the hill where there was nobody for mass. So that we could sit by the back in case my mother got overwhelmed. We had to get out quick. So you know, we were kind of worried about her a little bit. And I was the youngest of four. My oldest brother went and became a Christian brother when I was five years old. And he was 16 years old and joined the Christian brothers and went to New York. And then my brother Andy is a comedian as well. Now I have a sister three years older who's uh, uh, in Newfoundland and she's a, you know, she was, she works in the hospitals and stuff like that. You know, she's, she's, she's a straight one. Yeah, so quite a quite a variety in there, and 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 some intensities and some some difficulties too. But um, sounds like a a real like kind of especially being out and about way to like. I guess I was a little bit in the middle of that because my early childhood would have been um, the eighties, right? And so yeah. so it it was definitely more like TV and indoor based than, than what um, you would have experienced, but not. I don't think you know we didn't have you know cell phones and there wasn't any internet there so, so yes yeah yeah um no it's, it's you know i watched a lot of tv too because i didn't like going when i hit when i hit school i really didn't like it because the nuns were really scary and my mother would let me stay home you know she would write the magic note that said i was not well and i couldn't go to school and i would watch every fucking thing that came on that tv and i i can name a thousand tv shows that i watched and i I saw so many wonderful comedians on TV when I was a kid. Ed Sullivan would have on comedians. And then, you know, Carol Burnett was on. And then Mary Tyler Moore was on. And then, you know, like, you know, there was tons of funny women on TV when I was a kid. Lucy and, you know, all of these crazy funny people. I saw a lot of comedy on TV. And, you know, the Smothers Brothers and uh, George Carlin would come on the Smothers Brothers as a hippy dippy mailman. Then there was laughing. Oh my God! I there was a lot of awesome TV when I was a kid. Yeah, that that. So, do you think that was instrumental for for you, like being um, in, inspired to try comedy? Because that, you just listed off some giants. So I feel like a fat well, yeah. party or every day. Yeah. Well, you know, I didn't know that I like like one of the one of the um, one of the problems with my particular. Uh, life was that um, uh, discipline was not presented to me as a positive thing, and I was uh, I was kind of ruined in a way. And I don't I didn't have so I, I didn't have a lot of confidence because one of the ways you develop confidence is very important for a girl uh, for her father to really uh, you know stay by her and believe in her through her adolescence. This has particularly been proven that. Those are really important years to gain confidence in the in the working world, and that was exactly when my dad fell apart and really fucked up the family. So, like, I really didn't have the confidence. So when I was sixteen, but I was always really funny. Like, I would say hilarious kind of crack everybody up stuff, and uh, and I would do that in school and get in trouble. But I was also like doing acid in grade ten and missing school in grade eleven. Just wanted to get out, and I didn't have the confidence to try to get into the Newfoundland Traveling Theater Company. But my brother Andy told the guy, Kathy's good, don't worry, he'll be great. And so I went and did an audition for the Newfoundland Traveling Theater Company. And 
they gave me a job and I got to hang out with Tommy Sexton and uh, Diane Olson. And then um, that's when I first met Tommy. He was two years younger than me. And then we went to Toronto in the fall of 1973. And I had, you know, I didn't try to do comedy at all, right? We just went to Toronto in 73. Greg Malone was there. And um, Mary Walsh was going to school at Ryerson and Mary was in an apartment with Tommy and I and Diane and I came to stay there. And when everybody would keep telling us newfie jokes and we were all trying to fit into this Toronto like square peg and a round hole kind of vibe. And finally, we went to, you know, Tommy went to this guy in, at this theater that was doing theater past Mariah and said, can we have some money to do our own show? And the show that we did where we made fun of Mainlander's ideas of Newfoundlanders was so popular that we became like the mini Beatles. We got really popular. In in Toronto? or Yeah, in Toronto, okay. we did a show called Caught on a Stick about, you know, about people's idea about Newfoundland. And it was hilarious. And people just started lining up down the block because it was me and Greg and Tommy and Mary and Diane and Diane's boyfriend. And we were doing this funny stuff like, Oh, from the mainland, are you? Come on into the kitchen, boys, for a cup of tea. Like pretending <laughs> we are the quaint Newfoundlanders. Yeah. Perhaps you'd like to buy that table right there. That's been in the family for oh so long. You know, we're trying to fucking suck the new. You know, pretending that we that we're we're the stupid quaint Newfoundlander, right? right? right. And and it was really and and they we got a great review, and then we went back to Newfoundland, and this great um uh, this great satirist satirist named Ray Guy who used to write for the paper. He said he called us the children of Johnny Burke. And Johnny Burke was this guy that used to write these broadsides, these big song poems about what was going on in St. John's. And he would sing them on the corner. And and we came with this reflection of Newfoundland. It was a revolution in that before that theater that was being done in St. John's was mostly British drawing room farces done by the St. John's players with British accents and all that. And then right. all of a sudden, here we were doing like, oh, yes, we are we are Canada's happy province. Oh, we're happy, all right. Oh, yes, it might not be the tangible kind of happiness that you can touch, like the food and the clothing. You know, it was kind of like we started making fun of what people thought of Newfoundland and what Newfoundland seemed to be to people because people thought Newfoundlanders were stupid. And, and it was really, really fun to play with. So we started to, uh, we were, you know, and then we brought my brother Andy in and this other actor named Bob Joy, and we just made troop, and, and our second show was called Sickness, Death, and Beyond the Grave, another hilarious comedy. And we were only together as a big theater group for about three years because we split, um, you know, along the lines of people being <laughs> vegetarians and meat eaters, if you can believe it. Wow. But, yeah, because we became vegan and we were like totally just, dis- we were, you know, we were totally disgusted with people who still ate meat. It was really weird. Anyway, but the thing is that like the theater company just was like part of this cultural revolution in Newfoundland in the early seventies, where we had, you know, fabulous, you know, blends of rock and traditional music coming up with bands like Figgy Duff and Land of Mordor, and just incredible rich, you know, scene there. Like with, if people were wild and insane and crazy and, and, and extreme and out on the town drinking and, and quoting all of the great philosophers, like it was a, incredibly intense scene and for me i wasn't an intellectual i was just hanging on there you know and uh and i so i constantly walked away and said look guys i think i just want to go in fact my brother michael shot a document which is my brother andy has now uh, assembled this huge amount of films my brother died a couple of years ago and my brother andy has this film called the codco document where michael followed us around and uh, apparently there's a big chunk where I'm saying, uh, guys, I just want to go sell muffins in Vancouver. And people just had to constantly say to me, no, Kathy, you're an actor. Stay here. And I'm really grateful for that. that they did that. Right. No, you had a lot of good, good support. And I, I can just imagine like, you know, you know, 73, a bunch of Newfoundlanders in, in Toronto and, yeah. and, and, and every mixed in with everybody else too. And uh, yeah. I, I, I think what I took from that is most funny is like, e- even though I was, I was, would have been like negative 10 back then, I, I would have got kicked out of the, the early Codco for eating bacon or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, um, that, so it was so like, because that's I was looking up wiki said like you guys were like found it as a, a theater review in like in in 73 so and then um it was 
one one of the th- IMDb says the the TV show started in eighty six, but then Wiki says it started in eighty eight. Some were were there like some no. early specials or something or somebody? No, we, up. we we actually we came up here in eighty six, and our first show probably aired in eighty seven. Like we we did it in eighty six. Eighty six, we got together again and went to Expo eighty six in Vancouver. And then, then Michael Dunman said, do you want to do a TV show? And I had always been like, we got so much great material. Why are we letting this go? We have to do this again. And I was a single mother at this point. And, you know, and we, we, we pulled back together, uh, Andy, Tommy, Greg, Mary, and I, uh, the five of us, uh, yeah, Andy and Greg and, and Tommy and me and Mary. And we, we did start doing TV shows. We did, we did. 64 shows, Holy 64 shit. half hours. And we finished in 92 and we, Tommy died in 93. Uh, and Mary said to me in, in, in 92, I wanted to get into doing a, a pretend, a funny, a funny serial, like a soap, like there used to be a show on called soap. And I wanted to do a show like that, like a, yep. a send up of a soap and um, like a, a drama, but a funny one. And uh, Mary said, oh, I want to do a satirical news program. And I was like, oh, fuck. I've never even watched the news. She said, that's why you've got to do it, because you are you ha- you know nothing, and you're really fresh. Like, you have this fresh take on things, and because and you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> and so she gave me the job. And I feel like karmically, in a way, even though Mary and I are competitive and we have, we have a, a struggle, um, I feel like she uh, put me somewhere that really worked for me and gave me this show, which because of my various uh, challenges, it has really worked for me. And it was really kind of her. I've had struggles on the show over the years. And, but you know, like there was times in my early fifties when I thought, okay, I got to quit this now, but it's, it's been, it's been so great for a person like me who likes to fuck around and look at the sky a lot to have a show that goes 20 weeks of the year. Yeah. For, for those who don't know, um, Kathy is the only original member of the cast. And I, I think it's really funny that uh, Mary won that argument because, you know, we, I don't know, in Canada, it probably would have been like sliver of soap because we're all so fucking poor. Right. But uh, if you would, yeah. uh, would have done a soap takeoff, but uh, no, yeah. I, that's really, and, and I, I did, um, uh, cause ca- like I, I was, um, I would have been, I would have turned three the year that Codco came out. So I, I, Codco was, um, before my time, but, but I did watch a couple of episodes and then I watched a couple of 22, right. Just to sort of compare. And, and to me, and you can tell me what, what you think about this, but I, I, I think they were very similar in their energy and their like, um, zaniness and wackiness and stuff mm. like that. But, I, but I think that, that Codco was sort of more, um, more like Newfoundland based and more like everyday life kind of thing. Where whereas Twenty Two seemed more like all encompassing Canadian and with more of a political focus. Does that sound? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Twenty Two Minutes it was it has come off the news, but in the early days we do whatever we wanted. Like we do, Mary and I would do the two psychics who were sisters that would you know, so we could go off on tangents and then. Over the years, it's become like, you know, it's, it, there's been some funny stuff on 22, but it, it, it's, a, it, it's changed. And plus, I lost the board when the internet came on. Like, in 93, when we started the show, we had to cut out articles out of the newspaper. Wow. And we felt like, you felt like you were maybe one of the voices that had something to say. When the internet came online, and there was a thousand million blogs and people saying things and opinions and stuff coming from every fucking direction i thought why would my voice be relevant how can i even try to add to this it was it got really confusing to me but you know like cosmo was insane i hope you can this guy i met the other day told me he has a stick or like a computer uh hard drive thing or like disk drive that, that has like i don't know if all the shows but i'm telling you the stuff that was in cosmo was so fucking insane like my brother used to do, um, my brother Andy. Like when I when I think about it now, I think the guy. I used to think he's a violent sort of scary guy because a lot of his sketches would end in everybody getting stabbed and stuff. <laughs> right. But like <laughs> you know, but actually, his comedy 
it, anyway, I just, I, I, I was in awe all the time. And you know what? I'll tell you one really interesting thing, and I think it's on YouTube, but I was playing this very kind of spaced out sort of stupid person who was calling the open line show. And it was, it was maybe, okay, we started the show in 86. So maybe it was around 89, 90. And I'm on the phone with Greg and he's playing the open and open line guy. And I'm like, I think they should have a show where they show a psychiatrist's office. And, and, and the guy was, what, what do you think there or Joni? I'd be like, you know, like they should show like when people go into the psychiatrist and everything, that should be on TV. Cause like the way they get on, he goes, Oh, you think that'd be good do you? And then of course, Josh reality TV burst out. Right. And all of a sudden, you were seeing what happened at the fucking psychiatrist. That's <laughs> what television has been made of ever since. Yeah. Except for this new wave of Netflix and actual good shows on TV. There was this whole like disco area of uh, era of TV where yeah. everything was, you know, cheap and down. I, I love that uh, comparison. Like, like Jersey Shore is like the fucking disco of TV. Yeah. I of love, music. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, I was, did you like personally have, um, a, a prefer. Uh, oh no, I know what I wanted to mention. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I, as far as I know, have never met Andy, but just in watching like two of those shows, he must have had about thirty-seven hair pieces, like just, <laughs> in, just in two episodes. Like it, it, it was oh my wild. God. It was. Oh my wild. god! Like he had this one where he had a. a you know, the, remember that that military flat top haircut that guys used to have in the sixties? Yep. Where it was just flat, right? And sticking straight up. So Andy's there with a flat top haircut, a t-shirt, and dog tag. And then he's looking at the camera directly, and he's saying, uh, and he's eating a giant piece of chocolate cake, kind of miserable looking like he has to do it. <laughs> and he goes, and he goes, I was shot in the chocolate cake gland, and I no longer produce my own chocolate gland. And, <laughs> and he, has to, he has to eat chocolate every day just to keep his chocolate gland up. And it's like these He's like, he, oh fuck, man. Anyway, I, I, it's like this newfound appreciation for Andy has happened to me, and I, you know, I'm. There's no turning back. He's a fucking madman. Do you, um, do you personally have a uh, a preference yourself between like Codco and, and Twenty Two, like just for your own work, or or how how do you feel about that? Well, I feel like I've just been coasting for years on Twenty Two Minutes, and. And, you know, I, I, I have fun at the office and I'm kind of a, I, I enjoy, you know, having people that I know well that I, you know, and I love it going in and having Mark Critch go extremely funny. Like he is, he is hilarious when he's fucking around and, um, you know, there's, and Susan Kent has been wonderful. Like personally, you know, the thing about Codco, which I really realized when I went on the road with Mary in December again, is that. You know, we were so enmeshed emotionally that it was painful all the time. There was no boundary. We didn't have boundaries. And we, we were all children of alcoholics and Catholics. And we were all kind of, you know, you know, Andy is my brother and Andy and Greg were friends. And there was tension between them because it was like having two dads in the same family. And Mary was, you know, drinking in the early days. And then she, you know, she's, you know, she's frustrated and, and, you know, like, it was like, it was, and then Tommy, you know, Tommy was getting sick and uh, he had uh, AIDS and stuff. And it was crazy. We were in a crazy phase in our lives. And then 20, 22 minutes happens and it's me, Rick Mercer, Mary and Greg. And everybody is more respectful of each other, more boundaries. There's people in charge that we look to. There's people that are, you know, helping us and we don't have any sketches over two minutes. That's our first rule. So you don't have a 22 minute show with a 17 minute sketch and a one minute sketch. Everything is balanced. And it's the time of in the 90s when we are hitting all of the uh, shorter attention span, smaller hits, you know, nothing's long anymore. And so we shorten everything up. And so 22 minutes becomes uh, very enjoyable you know, experience like in the early days when I do Babe Bennett, and Joe Crow, and I had some fun, you know, we had a lot of fun. And then of course, you know, you know, I, I don't know. I guess it's because I have Mars and Taurus, but I, I just fucking say like, 
I, I used to be embarrassed that I was still there. And then after a while, you don't give a fuck. You wouldn't say to a nurse, are you going to be a nurse again this year? And it's like, yeah, I'm going to be a nurse. I'm a fucking nurse. That is a um, stubborn place to have your uh, work and uh, sex yeah. and war drive planet right in Taurus. Taurus is very stubborn. I, I am an astrology fan as well. Um, it might only be oh. us that gets that reference, but uh, that's okay. We're listening. Yeah. At least so. So, so okay. So it, se- so it seems to me like, like, like Codco was like much more like kind of raw and sort of fraught with all these emotional difficulties and, 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 and 22 was more sort of seamless and, 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 and perhaps professional and things like that. But well, it, in the beginning it, we right. were quite emotional, but we were, it was a hangover. We, you know, we right. used to call up the producer and say, what happened to my sketch? But I'll tell you something. I didn't get to stay on a TV show for 27 years by walking into anyone's office and going, where's my sketch? Like, I played a cool game to keep that fucking job. I had four years there about three years ago when they wouldn't let me on the desk. And I almost died of stress. And I hung in there and, you know, kept going back to them and saying, guys, really? Really? Right? And and finally, like, I, I won back my place on the desk. And it was just incredibly painful. Like, Physically, it was such a toll for me, and stress-wise, like uh, I didn't, I just, I really had to hang in. I had to send strong love to people that were really upsetting me in order to not get mired in illness from from the stress of it, because wow, it was really harsh. They 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 took me off the desk, and poor Susan, she had to you know get all dressed up to go out on the desk, and she would look into my room. This is a beautiful spirit that fucking Susan Kent is. She would lean into my room and go, I love you. You're my hero. I'll see you in a couple of minutes. And she'd go out and do the show. And she had to fucking go out and greet the audience. And it's like, you guys really think that I shouldn't be there on Monday night when the audience comes, when the party happens for the week? Like, it was like, I got kicked in the box. Damn. Yeah, it was hard. Yeah, well, folks, um, and 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 the thing is too, like, right, like it's not it's not her fault, right? You know, so she's she's doing yeah. doing the best she can with with the what, but uh, I guess the the squeaky wheel gets the desk grease, I guess. Fine, so you stuck with it, you got your spot well, back. Well, yeah, I um, uh, I finally, I just stayed, I stayed with it, stayed with it, and uh, I had to, you know, I I finally, I told somebody in Toronto when I was up there and. And they said, why don't, you know, they, they said, why don't you go have a chat with Kathy to one of the producers? And I said, this has been brutal and, uh, and it's ridiculous. And I don't remember it right now. I, I, I got, I, I won, I won back what I needed and I, gosh, I can't believe I can't even remember now, but I, but I, I was, I was, when it comes to my livelihood, I really can become quite a serious and uh, intense person. <laughs> you got to fight for survival sometimes, I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes total sense to me. And um, so. And as- even at that, I get paid a, like one, two thirds of what, Rick, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what Mark Critch gets paid. I never say that in public, wow. but like, I don't get even paid with as the, much your crit. seniority on the show. You well, that's, absolutely, I get paid like an old white woman, bitch. I get paid like an old white woman. Man, that's fucked. I'm 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 sorry. Oh, yeah, I they, didn't know that. Yeah, they kicked me back. They kicked me back uh, for those four years, and then you have to creep back up again. And and I, I'm not going to ever get there. And so you know, I have to kind of go. Yeah, I only did 15 shows this year, and I have a place in the country and. And I know that if I develop my my writing and all that, I'm I'll, I'm going to be, if not like rich again, I'm going to be fine. Right, right, yeah. You're gonna you're gonna get. I mean, it, it it's not maybe as good as it could be or should be based on fairness and seniority and those things. But yeah, yeah but it doesn't matter. Right, right. You're still you're yeah. still getting by. No, that's great. Yeah. And and so as far as far as I know, I would say you're probably most known for for those two shows but i know that you have done um some film work and theater work and i know you do stand up because we've been on at mm-hmm. least two shows together so mm-hmm. um and a couple like how, how do you how do you feel like 
do you are are they are they just all all different or do you have a preference like i remember you talking early in the show that you wanted to you know get that get that book out you know yeah j- j- yeah well um you know i've had the good fortune a couple of times to have somebody work with me like my brother michael and my brother andy in, in 1986 i wrote a show called wedding in texas which was quite famous in canada and i played it in toronto i, I like it was a hit show um i but Andy, like Andy, stayed with me, and and they say that people who have ADD are have to get the emotional part taken care of, where they're seeking, where they're looking for this a, a, approval thing. Because what happens with ADD is your your frontal lobe doesn't develop because your mother is distracted when you're a baby, and they don't stare into your eyes enough. Right. They're supposed to keep staring into your eyes to develop your frontal lobe because the first nine months of life is like the second nine months of gestation. So I basically, having my brother working with me, made me have so much confidence about everything that I wanted to create. And then the second time that happened, I, I worked with, with Charlie Reindress and wrote a show called Me, Dad, and the 100 Boyfriends. But in terms of uh, one-woman shows, the one I did recently, uh, my director was Anne-Marie Kerr from Halifax. And I did a show called uh, Stranger to Hard Work. And that show is fucking, that was a really fun, good show. Uh, but, you know, I blew my corporate gig because of my ADD and because of not wanting to, you know, because of my, you know, I didn't really want to be there. Uh, but like stand up, I just, I did such a chunk of stand up in my one woman show that I realized uh, I really, you know, I've, 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 I'm not driven with the stand up, but I feel like it's fun to develop. This year, I felt like my battery was dead with the show, and then all the writers came down to the Carlton one night, and they and the Partis Parker said, "You know, it's just going to be experimental, new material." And he got to go down for two nights on the weekend in January, and I fucking played in front of a couple of the writers. There you go. And the writers, the writers went back to the writers' room, telling everybody what a killer stand-up I was, and then I was like. Suddenly, my battery with the writer's room was charged and everything was wonderful. I, I felt like they they could see who I was and that I really was sharp and funny. And I just wasn't this, you know, hanging on old person who was just still doing a couple of funny things on the show, you know? No, so I that mean, was just- yeah, it's fun, funny story that you, uh, yeah, because I, I know, um, or I'm, I'm not really in touch with him now, but I know part is from like when I first started in comedy and uh he he was around just starting out then as well um and uh but yeah no like you um you totally crushed uh the last show we did together that uh accessibility yeah. awareness week show and uh um, that was a good show yeah like those guys yeah. were there to laugh right like, i was talking about how i when i see a guy with a big nose i you know i like it's a funny thing that happens to me very very spontaneously if i see a, a man with a nice big nose, I do this kind of little motion. It's a funny little secret motion that happens with my pelvis where I kind of go, or eh, I think I'd like to fuck that guy's face. <laughs> well, I, 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 I do have a very big nose. So I'm, I know you do. <laughs> I know it's, you have a great nose. You look like you're on some fucking coin. I you know. Right? Like, I could, I could, I could be like the Roman Emperor Nero or something, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my 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 uvula just got pregnant. <laughs> We're nuts here, oh folks. Um. So no, that's that's great. And um, if if things are, I'm, I assume you're probably going to be on this show if things are. Uh, tidied up by June where we can do shows again, right? Because Mara's doing... Uh... Yeah, but you know, like, I'm the kind of person where it's like, oh, but God, you know, when when the girl from the, twi- from the uh, comedy festival says, we need the beat sheets for your, for your jokes by oh, March fuck. 1st for a fucking eight weeks later, it's going to be, I'm like, eh, you know, middle finger, fuck it, you know, like, I don't want to play if I have to send you the fucking beat sheet of my jokes eight weeks before. How do I know what I'm doing? And then, like, yay, coronavirus! I don't have to do the comedy <laughs> festival. But like, have have any of those like organizer types actually done 
live perform because like the some I mean you can you can plan for some of that shit or like you know when you're going to yeah. curse but some of that stuff is going to occur naturally in 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 the course of your speech and how you're playing the crowd and stuff so you, you like you that's not well yeah, you know I learned a big lesson about stand up and and it seems like you you know like everything I learn it takes me forever like now I'm 65 and I'm finally figuring this out but I learned about comedy that, oh, well, I was listening to Norm MacDonald talking to Kevin Nealon one night, and Kevin Nealon said, we had a place in L.A. where we'd ask people to come in and do eight new minutes. But some people got laughs, so I knew the material wasn't new. And then my mind went, doy, oh my God, you do material that you just wrote that day, you don't get the fucking laughs. And I was going on the Halifax Comedy Festival with material that I was writing that day, and I was this flat as as fucking piss on a plate because I didn't know you had to work your jokes to get them going. Like I have a joke about uh, my dog, like right. that that I thought my dog was a was a, a reincarnated human that wasn't happy to be a dog, and I have this whole bit about my dog, you know, eating weed one day and looking at me and started singing like you know like one pill makes you larger or whatever, and it never it didn't get a laugh. At all, uh, and like now, I can do the joke about that, and I. Can, it depends. I. I don't know. There's a lot to learn about stand up. I can understand why people want to do it all the time to figure out the nuances. Because the same show, the same joke, just fucking dies on the vine, and then another night, it's you have them roaring in the aisles. Yeah, I mean, I I've been around it enough. Like, I I've I've seen people crush, and I'm like, Ooh, I think the crowd's being a little too generous here, right? Or right. like, I've seen people bomb, and I'm like, I think the crowd's not really being fair, you know? Like, like, um, yeah. And, and I think in terms of like, you know, not doing stuff you just wrote that day, probably a good general rule, but but not an absolute, right? Like, um, no, it depends on where you are. But if you're going to get up on a comedy festival and they're going to shoot you, yeah, they, no, and you're going to be nervous, and the fucking lights are on the audience as they are in those fucking comedy festivals. But yeah. you know, like like my friend uh, Heidi, uh, Noah, she's really cute. She has blonde hair. Her boyfriend's Mace and so- Sophie Buttle. She 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 was just up for Juno for her comedy album, and she said comedy needs a low ceiling because the laughs need to bounce off the ceiling. I thought it was a beautiful right. idea that a small room really works sometimes if you're ready. Like I, I thought, oh, I killed in Ju- January. I think I can fucking kill. And I walked into the fucking yuck yucks a couple of weeks ago, and I just, I, I didn't look at the jokes all day, and I went up and said. Oh yeah, when they what was they gonna tell you? Oh yeah, when when they have a parade in Halifax, and it's like those people looked at me like she she should be slicker than this. Like there's something right. that I've never gotten about stand up. Like I don't, it's 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 hit or miss with me. I don't have a solid personality. I used to love it when Maria Bamford would say, "Am I right, ladies?" Like she'd do that bit where she was being a stand up, you know? Right. Yeah, she I mean she's phenomenal and probably the best like wacky sort of stand up that I that I've ever oh seen. Oh my god, she's um, incredible. Yeah. And and um I think I think that's like uh really cool. Like I, I know for myself, like I like the stuff that I do that's like sort of like new and fre- fresh like that it, it's not something that i wrote that day it's something that that i've mm-hmm. i've come up with right in that moment because because i want to react to what's what's just happened and, and that way like it doesn't doesn't always work but often it does because it's contextual to the audience because they've just seen what i'm referring to in a kind like i have a like performance philosophy of like being like water i, I guess i just want to let stuff uh run through me and and just sort of react. That's my idea, wow. I guess. Yeah, that's great. That's great because you certainly are funny. Whenever I've seen you, I fucking you know. And and even when you, I don't, I'm sure you have times when you go, oh. Yep, I sure do. I'm not perfect by any means, you know. Like no, hell no. Yeah. Um. So. And do you smoke weed, Josh? Um. I do, and I don't. It's uh, yeah, I'm yeah, on yeah. and off. Um, yeah, me too. Okay. And, and, uh, yeah, it, it, and, and, um, it could have, it could have had something to do with my psychosis. So I, I approach it very carefully nowadays. Have you had like psychosis a couple of times or just, um, 
Maybe, but only one that was really the the one that was really pronounced that I couldn't function. You know, like if if I did have, mm-hmm. I probably have had delusions of grandeur in the past, but I I was always able to sort of uh, manage them. You know, and, right, and, right, and function. But but the one from like uh, December twenty eighteen was a complete different ball game. Like delusions and or hallucinations and voices and which I don't oh. have anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and like my, my body, like my physical body was, uh, was weaker and like, I, I couldn't move as well. And my like motor skills were affected. Like I was fucked. Like I was very, Oh Ill. man. But I've, I made it, I think. Um, and so- what, and do you have to like nutritionally, how do you shore up your nervous system? Um, I, I get good, healthy meals um especially from my mother a little less healthy from my grandmother but still good hearty meals that's like and um i i I do eat too much sugar at times for sure but but i think the meals are pretty good and uh you know i i uh, i take i take pills now and um and and they're working yeah. Oh, well, the biggest thing for me has always been, I, I think with the CP, I have a sleep disorder. So, yes. um, and, and oddly, like the last night or two has been a little rough, but not too, too bad. But, but that is what, like, I had, I had not slept essentially for weeks when I, when I got that bad oh, yeah. psychosis. So yeah, that yeah, yeah, to anybody, yeah. I guess, right? Yes. Yes. Um, like, uh, yeah. uh, that's an, that's astounding that, that stress that you, and, and of course, what I really appreciate was that you, you know, like there, even though Facebook is evil, there is also a community because we know what's happening with people. That's like, right. you know, like Erica, Erica Colness, like she has melted down on Facebook and then come back together. And, you know, and then when she starts to talk a lot again, we start going, oh, oh are you, oh, you know, you don't, you yeah. don't get defensive if she's losing it. But like, it's, 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 it's an amazing platform. Like, I don't know where else to actually, when I want to, Right. Like I have a lot to say, obviously I have, and I write very spontaneously and, and just like I talk, I have a strong writing voice, even if I don't have a lot of editing uh, kind of thing, but I don't know where to put everything. And sometimes when I write a Facebook note, it works for me, but I don't know where, you know, to have a platform these days, like, like, you know, like even Norm, Norm McDonald's brother, um, Neil McDonald doesn't, ha- you know, doesn't have a newspaper. People who used to write columns don't have newspapers. Like, you know, where are you going to get the, the the platform to make a major, you know, put out a piece that gets read? You know, like Facebook is a weird place, but like I'm a, kind of been addicted to it since 2007. Yeah, and that's when I got on too. So yeah, we're right on the same wavelength there. Yeah, no, and, and it is. Um... It is really, yeah, because you would have seen, all, all, or at least some of that going on through my posts and stuff. But um, yes, when you couldn't sleep, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, that's been a that's been a pretty con, you know. But it, for the most part, that's been taken care of now. So I'm, I'm. Much do you more, have? Do you do a good magnesium? Do you have any good magnesium? Uh, I'm looking at my bottle right here. It is uh, magnesium glycinate, uh, oh, two two hundred milligram good. capsules. Nice. It just it was right in front of me as you said that, so that was quite. See, timing is everything, eh? Like, um, yeah. So, so, um, and uh, speaking of the posts and stuff, this is how I would have learned this about you. How did you get uh, hip to Buddhism? How did how did that? Well, you know, you? Um, when when I was uh, when when Mara, I had Mara, my daughter, who is now thirty. 38. She has three sons. I have three grandsons that live in my neighborhood. Uh, and I have two daughters, had another daughter when I was 40. And, um, when I was in my, let's say 1990, I'd be about 35 and Mara was about nine or 10. I, um, my brother, Michael, who was uh, 11 years older than me had come and done a little Shambhala training. And, um, he said, you know, you, you got to check this out. And I was like, I meditate, fuck off, you know? (laughs) And then he's like, no, this is, this is really fucking different, you know? And so I, um, I started to, uh, go, uh, I started to go, uh, I don't know if I went to, I I started going out with Jeff Rosen, who is a, a Buddhist here. 
because we were still coming up there. We were doing Kodko until 92. So this was around 1989. I started doing Shambhala training. And, um, and then uh, I was Im- immediately uh, completely uh, devoted to Chogim Trungpa. He, he's a genius, a fucking amazing person. And he did it all loaded drunk too, which is amazing. Yeah, that's but, I was um, going to bring that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but he was, he was, he was incredible. They say that he would be talking when he was drunk and fall asleep, and when he would wake up like twelve hours later, he would continue the same, same thing. <laughs> Finish <laughs> but, the sentence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I, got, I, I don't know, but I did. I wasn't there, but, uh, but immediately, I, I, I love this guy, Kense Rinpoche, his, his teacher. Like I saw this amazing film called anyway i had jeff rosen being a, a complete and utter you know uh, uh dedicated buddhist and then i started doing shambhala training after i read shambhala the sacred past of the warrior about just living in an uplifted way and and being you know being you know having good head and shoulders in your own life and you know just it, it's a very you know it's a very sane and it doesn't require any suspension of disbelief you can just fucking it's you know what that's why they call it dharma because it's, it's that means truth and it doesn't have any kind of thing you have to all right i'll bridge that gap with my imagination it all fucking shakes out it's just amazingly uh sane and, and clear so i started doing that and then i started coming out with john odenthal who was another buddhist and uh, and he was really you know kind of a encouraging person uh and uh, so i just kept uh, doing it and then i you know i i took refuge and became an actual buddhist in in 93 uh i i went to seminary which is when you you go to seminary when you've done a lot of personal practice which is the beginning is called the hinayana path which means you're really working with your own mind and then you're supposed to graduate in some way to become a more because you've practiced meditation, if you actually sit and practice and your heart opens up and you understand that everybody's in the same boat, and we all have these frantic minds that think all the time and that we, you, you develop this great compassion and you, you open up your path to be more a bodhisattva. You take the bodhisattva vow of, of, you know, caring for others and stuff like that. And then you kind of think, okay, now I'd like to, you know, if you're really into it, then you could actually do these secret teachings called the Vajrayana where you would actually employ different sorts of visualizations and stuff that would actually bring you along the path to becoming sort of like, not with a goal, but just with a general kind of inclination towards becoming more awake and more and more kind of enlightened, but not in this kind of like, we're going to get enlightened, but in this kind of like, let's follow this path just for the hell of it kind of thing. I don't understand because I didn't really have that kind of, I went to, seminary and then i then i really fell down on the job you're supposed to do a hundred thousand prostrations and it's a it's a practice called nundro where there's a hundred thousand of this and a hundred thousand of that and i completely fell apart and didn't do it ultimately once you have a practice of meditation if you you know you your path is is your view it's all about your view you know it's like i see things like a buddhist and I am a Buddhist and I'm nothing else but a Buddhist and I'm never going to be, uh, even though I don't really have a, a particular teacher at the moment, except right. for Trumpa and he's been dead since 86. Yeah, no. Um, and, and what, what I, and, and I'm no, um, Buddhism expert or anything. Um, um, my, my best friend from high school was part of, um, the Shambhala Buddhism and, uh, oh. but, but uh, yeah, uh, Torin, uh, you might know Oh, him. Torin. Yeah. There's that. Isn't he funny and stuff? Yeah, he's a he's a really good rapper too. So uh um that would be yeah. he's in he's in BC now, but uh but yeah, like my 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 sense has always been that um you know, it is pretty tolerant, you know, and that's that's the kind of things that I I, I pretty much have respect for for all faiths because I I I look at them as, you know, what what can they do to help people and and personally like I I much prefer the idea of enlightenment to like the bodhisattva, like it was explained to me one time, like the bodhisattva has uh, pledged to come back until every yeah. blade of grass has attained enlightenment. Right. So it's just, it like, just be being, being helpful. Just saying, okay, look, 
instead yeah. of like getting off the wheel, I'll just keep coming back. Yeah, that's right. Because because enlightenment for its own sake, the, I just I I kind of need a like a practical application. And I mean, I I don't you know yeah. like I mean yeah. I I I personally believe in God, but I I don't care if anybody else does. You know, like I don't yeah I don't yeah think yeah, that's, yeah We we the the thing where the argument needs to be is what what are we doing on the planet and why? You know, not these. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. And also, like you know, um. Uh, what wh- when you talk about like faith, hope, charity, love, you know, like if you it, it doesn't matter what your what your mind is doing. It's like what are you doing? Like I I really go by by Jesus Christ and in, in my philosophy of generosity with people that I've helped out in their lives, and I think you know Jesus Christ would say you know whatever you do for these the least of my brethren, you know, this you That's do right. for me. Like I always thought, you know, like if like Jesus would say, if somebody takes your hat, give them your coat. Like you don't fucking, you don't, you don't stop and go, no, I'm not going to give this time. Like it's a very, it's a big dilemma for me because I've always felt like I don't, I'm no different from anybody else. Why should I, if someone said to me, do you have 500 bucks? I would go like, no. And then I would go, Oh Jesus, I do have 500 bucks. Right. What the fuck? Who do I think I am? You know, and so I, I got into a lot of trouble financially because of that. But, you know, I really do feel like the Buddhists, right? Like, I never understood why we don't have a soup kitchen. Why don't we go out to the community more? Like, there's just this, there's yeah. something mis- missing in that respect, you know, because we're the practice lineage. And, you know, but we don't have a, we don't have a community right now. It's, it's kind of, I still have friends that, that have been Buddhists for years. But, like, you know, some of them are still friends with the Sakyong and, even my daughter, she's probably still a student, you know, because she doesn't want Shambhala to fall apart because there's Sun Camp and the Shambhala School. There's lots of really wonderful things about Shambhala, you know, and it's a community. Yeah. It's hard to lose that when you have three children. Yeah, no, to- totally. Um, and yeah, but I, I, I think you're right. If like there could be like soup kitchens and things like that, that would be um, uh, uh, much, much better. But I mean... Um, yeah, no. That, oh, I think. Um, so yep. I looked at your. Well, I don't know if it was your website, but I like you, you're you're kind of elusive online. Like there wasn't there wasn't that like you know a wiki entry, but it's not that large. And then I I found something. It was like part of like pa- Paquin artists or something, and it it said that you have an eco friendly household so i was i was wondering if like um buddhism uh influenced your 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 um like um environmental concerns and th- things like that oh uh, no but also you know uh that was what i was going to say was that uh we need the earth in order to have a place to be bodhisattvas and to be you know here and it we are you know the buddhists have have uh the Buddha and uh, has, uh, you know, prophesied kind of blah, 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 whatever a, a five hundred year dark age, and we they say we're only at the beginning of it. Beginning? Ah! Uh. I mean, even if we were halfway through, we still have two hundred and fifty years. Fuck yeah! Anyways, uh, it's going to be a r- 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 But anyway, um, yes, no, I uh, no, I have always, but when I was a kid, I didn't like school, but I, but when I started studying herbs and. And you know, and and health and fasting and blah blah blah. I got really interested in um, in health because I got asthma really bad when I was twenty two. My mother died. Mm. And I couldn't Ooh. breathe, and I I had asthma, and I didn't know about puffers, and I started fasting to get my to be able to breathe again. And I got really interested in herbs and uh, and health, and and you know, started to do things like hmm, I you know I got to give up dairy or I got to give up week or I've got to do something with my diet to figure out what's going on with my body and stuff. And, um, then I was, and then I've always been like, you know, a purist about, you know, natural products and, and, you know, I, I, I'm an environmentalist because I, I love the world. I love the trees and the water and the fish and the animals. And like lately, ever since this, this COVID thing, I haven't been able to eat like I was eating halal chicken for a while and now I feel like, Oh, halal chicken is fed grains and and maybe they're not treated as well as I thought. I think the time has come to stop treating animals so 
horribly and people eating all of these tortured animals is not doing yeah. anything for their fucking minds. It's not doing anything for their bodies. And I'm, you know, so I, I've been kind of a militant hippie. Like today I was thinking like, oh, what I wrote it on my phone. Hang on. I, I wrote down things are tilting towards the hippies and we're going to be able to help you out just like the first nations, but you're going to have to admit that you don't know what the fuck's going on first. Hmm. And it's like, we, we've been here with fucking, you know, yogurt and wheatgrass since the seventies. So, you know, we'll, we'll still be here if you need us. Right. And it's like, I, I had, when I, when I, what I, I lost a whole lot of money by investing with this real idiot. And, um, uh, he fucked me over, and when oh, I got geez. my money back from him, I I thought I'll ne- I got scared, and I wouldn't invest any money for many years. And then I, I, I every time I would go on a trip, I would scribble a will really fast, and I'd say buy some land to protect from development because I really have been mortally fucking disgusted by how we destroy the natural world, and I, I've always found it just brutal when I see a truck full of trees going down this road or if i you know if they put up a building and they don't you know they don't make a nod to the the environment at all it just drives me crazy so but one day i thought every time i write this will i say buy some land and i was down in lunenburg and i say hey there's some land for sale with a little you know with a little brook on it maybe i should buy some land with my money and so i found this land in inland of mahone bay and I bought 350 acres of forest and I built an off grid house on this lake where nobody else actually has a house. And it's a pretty big lake. And, um, uh, and I, you know, I just, I've, I've had that house now for about eight years and I spend more and more time out there in the summer and I just got a barrel sauna out there. So I'm excited that I'm going to have a little sauna there too. And, um, and I've got, um, I've just basically, it's a little piece of fucking heaven. So, you know, I, I count my blessings that I, I was smart enough and confident enough at that time to go, fuck it, man, I'm going to buy this land. And that's where I'm going to put my money instead of oil, gas, tobacco and mining. Fuck those things. No money is ever going to, of my money is going to make any money on anything that kills people or hurts people or throws them off their land. I'm just going to buy land with my with my money, and that's what I did. That's um, that's very responsible, and and I'm just that's not an upper Cornwall by any chance, is this? No, I, but I can, but I, but I know what you mean. Like, but the uh, reason I say that is because my father has land out there, and and we're somewhat astra- of what is strange, and I I just thought it would have been a really really cool coincidence if you'd bought land from my father. <laughs> yeah, oh. but but no, probably not. But but close well, by. It, 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 I I don't. I don't necessarily want anybody to know exactly where it is because, okay, because these are the, these are the days that were, were, were talked about where, you know, and, and I, there's a, there was a guy named Victoria Sovinskas that wrote this book called survival in the 21st century. And in 1976, I gave that book to everybody for Christmas and uh, drove everybody crazy with my dreadlocks and fucking, you know, so it's it. And so I said to my friend Whitey the other day, uh, Whitey, what did Victoria say about, these times and what happens when the marauders come, you know? And she said, well, it, she said, Victoria said we should fast. And that when the marauders come to the door, we say, come in friends and fast with us. <laughs> so, you know, I just I realized know, that man. like, they're, they're marauders. They're probably pretty hungry. Yeah? We, I know. And like, we have no food. We're just fasting ourselves, but you're yeah. welcome to come in and join yeah. us. Yeah. Have some oh shelter at least. Yeah. Meanwhile, you should have some food behind the false wall. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, I, I just, I don't know. Just my mind went there and, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not in touch with my father, but, uh, but if, if you had bought land from my father, that would have been a, a, a very, What's his very name? interesting. What's his name? Your uh, father. P- Peter Dunn. Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. yeah. So. What's your mom's name? Lita Rodriguez. Really? Yeah, I'm a quarter Portuguese. Oh, suddenly you became even more attractive. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that, that nose just keeps growing and growing, eh? <laughs> Whew, I'm not even going to be able to fit through doors soon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> drinking drinking coffee and I'm hitting the bottom. Um, so, okay. <laughs> I 
think we've I think we've covered a lot of cool shit. I I was curious um if you like if you had your druthers like what would what would you most like to see change in the world and 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 where do you think we're we're screwing up and also where do you think we're like getting it right? Oh. And I know that's kind of a big You know, un- unfortunately, you know, the nurturing like we we are we are in a very challenging place obviously we are we're being steamrolled by you know it's it's been brutal it's been brutal and we're lucky that we are in canada um and that we have at least you know health care you know i pay a, a shitload of taxes and i'm grateful that that people can go to the hospital without like fucking ruining their lives i, I can't believe the u.s what are they going to do now, Josh? Off the record, like, what happens to these people who have to go in with the fucking COVID? Do they get charged eight grand for going to the hospital? I don't know. I I don't know what it, it the the infrastructure and organization from from the little bit that I understand and follow, which is which is not much. Um, I I think is fucked. Like, and and um, I I I I think a lot of people are going to die needlessly. That's my take away on that but i mean yeah i do i like i i have to say that you know i would say raw 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 you know like we all need way more vitamin d than they're telling us we all need to like shore up our fucking immune system and fight 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 and uh, you know fight for you know fight for uh staying alive and uh, you know and and like i i don't i don't know i like I hope that there's some glimmer of light that comes through. I'm certainly grateful that, that, uh, you know, I do feel that, that even though he seems very strange when he talks, I do feel that Tr- Justin Trudeau has a basic sanity that I really appreciate. But, yeah, he, you know, he but he's not that he's not bought by, you know, because look, it's like the first nations. They didn't want to, they, they wanted to, to, you know, be the guardians of the forest, but eventually they're starving and they have to sell some fucking trees, you know? And it's like, you know, it, it's hard for everybody because, you know, everybody needs to make a living, but like we can make choices. I'm sure that we can do it. Like it's, it's, it is so much insanity that we've accepted. I, we really need to embrace the feminine now or else, you know, it's like, we're living in an abusive relationship with the masculine principle that needs to fucking shift. You know, like I'm hoping that everybody runs over to the other side of the ship and it, and it tips another way right now because uh, they'll be brought to their knees with humility with what they'll go through. I don't know. I say they, but I hope it's not me. Right. I, 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 I totally um, believe there needs to be much more uh, nurturing and a lot less uh, plundering, and and, uh, yeah. and I think I think that's kind of what it what it um, boils boils down to in that sense. And and I I, I agree. Like I I like what you're saying, like Trudeau. Like yeah, he's 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 totally part of um, the political elite and the power structure and all those kinds of things. But I don't think he's a lunatic. So that's. Uh, at least somewhat sobering, I think. Yeah, he try he tries to he tries to maintain, it, and and it is a tough job. You know, like I'd rather listen to him than Rick Mercer, who I feel is a little bit more right wing. <laughs> I, I haven't I haven't heard anything from Rick Mercer in years, so I have I have no he, he idea. just did, he just he was starting a rant this morning, and I just didn't want I just don't want to hear anybody say like take your medicine and go home and sit down. It's like, yeah, but you know, it's bigger than that. We got to stop blocking wisdom yeah. and, and laughing at it and mocking it. And, you know, wisdom and femininity, it's been raped and, and brutalized and shut up and silenced too long. And that's where we ended up sick and, and unwell and losing the earth. Like, it's like they have, they T H E Y day, like, Tommy used to say, T-H-E, them, him, them, 
Yeah. They have brought us to the brink of the sixth grade extinction. We cannot trust them anymore. And, you know, you say you want a revolution. We all want to change the world. Sure I don't do. know what it's going to look like. No. And did you get that? Like, and sorry, I'm going off here, but you get that yeah, like yeah. sense that because things are so fluid and moving right now and breaking down, like that this could Oh, this could open the door for some really good stuff and some really responsible. Oh, yes. But I mean, it, some, yeah. I, uh, yes. Go ahead. But it could also open the door for some like Hitler fascists too, right? Because things are so, oh, you know, and, and, and the way people are, I, I just have this like, this horror in my head of like, you know, somebody going on about, you know, pure Americans or pure Canadians and, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And we have to close our borders and, 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 and all of a sudden. <laughs> You know, you know like, it, it's I, I think the potential is there for both, right? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, you know, like, like, the, like the Buddhists say, there's a, there's a wisdom aspect to each quality, and there's, there's an enlightened aspect, and a, and there's a degraded aspect. Like, there's two sides of every coin, and, uh, you know, like, whew, and, and sometimes I think, oh my God, this is beautiful, like. You know, the pollution is clearing and, and people are on the radio going, you know, education is not just attending school and sitting in a desk. It's also being with your family. Yeah. And I'm like, what happened? Did did everything just flip over? You know, and it's, it's the way that we actually think all the time. And it's like, I, I'm not familiar with Rudolf Steiner, but his philosophy is shared extensively by the great Dr. Thomas Cowan, who I think you should look up. Unfortunately, right now, he's got a, a video about how dangerous 5G is. And so, of course, he's not going to be popular with the world. But he has written a great book about the the philosophy, the, uh, the, the conjecture, or whatever you call it, that cancer is in the cytoplasm of the cell, which is the water part. And it's a great book called Cancer and the New, Philosophy, uh, the New Biology of Water. And I love that guy. He's great. But it's like everything feels really extreme to the world because people don't want to have to think about that. Like, you know, like people don't want to have to like, like the anxiety, like you have to have a lot of anxiety right now. And people who like your mom's alive, she's looking out for you. There's people who love you. But yeah. like, like there was a girl across the street tonight when I drove up and she was shaking like shaking and i said what's going on and she said like oh too much news too much news and she was actually shaking and i said and she said i, I just got laid off and she was shaking and uh, i was like listen i said i live right here and i'm you know and i'm here and just like don't forget that i'm here across the street and you know don't be hungry and don't be scared because i'm right there you know yeah. and it's like i thought it's so awful. Like one day I, Ken was telling me that you could order food from the warehouse market or blah, blah, blah. And I didn't know how to do it. I got that existential dread fear that one, that one day we would all run out of food and there would be no food on the shelves and nothing's going to come. And we're going to, you know, it's going to get really fucking crazy and, you know, shit like that. Yep, that, that totally. and, and I don't go there, you know, cause you can't, you don't borrow trouble from the future. You have to be in the moment. That's right. You you can go there, but you can't stay there because you can't yes. function that way, right? No. It's like people in New York, they're they're on the ground dealing with what's going on right now. And and they're not they're not they, they have to. They have to just fuck deal in the moment, you know? And right now we are not in New York, but we have to deal with whatever is happening right here right now for us and it's just like it's it's karma man <laughs> yeah like, it, like earth like planet karma you know i think yeah like it's shocking you know like impermanence is real nothing really is permanent and even the earth itself you know and and like you know people think oh well we won't be here it'll be our grandchildren i'm like if you're a buddhist you think Think again. We are our grandchildren, motherfucker. We're going to be back and we're going to be very hot. Right. Right. And, 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 and my thing is like, is if it's your grandchildren, like, where's your fucking heart? It's your grandchildren. Don't <laughs> yeah, you love it's your, your grandchildren. grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
there's a couple couple quick uh like um uh comedy ones that I that I forgot about um before um I was just curious um what like okay for first um do you, do, you, do you still like it you know like uh, 35 40 years later uh, 40 I guess going back to 73 46 years later is it, do you still still like doing comedy uh Do you know, can I just, I'm going to tell a story while you're thinking about that. Um, I I met Mark Breslin, right? The founder of Yuck Yucks in the Halifax Yuck Yucks bathroom. And uh, we, we we shook hands and I was like, oh, I better dry off. And he's like, oh, they're still wet. And I'm like, yeah, it's better than pee though, right? And he agreed. And uh, he, he, um, he, he. I asked him, like, you know, do you still like this? And he was like, whoa, that's a loaded question. So so I, I was kind of, yeah, curious to, to see uh, what, what you might have to say about that. Yeah, I've always really liked, you know, like Joni Mitchell's the laughing and crying, you know, it's the same release. I really like, I like evocative, poignant, um, you know, kind of a mixture of, uh, like, and so I don't, you know, I, I love really good comedy, like well-written comedy. I love mm-hmm. Curb Your Enthusiasm and, you know, that guy in that fucking Leon. Do you ever watch Curb Your Enthusiasm? Um, it's been a while, but I, oh, I've, yeah. o- I've anyway, only seen movie, yeah. Like, I love funny, funny comedy, but personally, I like to write, I like to write, like, very kind of, like, almost a, like, Po- prosy kind of poetic sort of you know like uh you know I-, I think i've got a long way to go creatively and comedy you know may come along with me i think i am funny like i think but i don't want to have to you know be funny no i i've always had uh, you know i i've always been of two minds like i i don't you know i've always not like I have Aquarius rising as well, so I kind of have the, I kind of have that thing of wanting to, you know, be big, big helpful. Like I, I, I wish that I could be a healer, and you know, and 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 in some way, like, be like I have this story I just wrote about my mother, where she was agoraphobic and couldn't go out, but people came to my house to sit with her and to eat cheese and crackers and smoke cigarettes and talk to my mom and that people, you know, people were healed by her, even though she suffered so much in her life. Mm -hmm. And, and then, and I said, you know, people, and I have suffered so much with with the way my mind works and doesn't work. And that uh, like, it's, it's, it's torture trying to write 1500 words for that class. I spent two weeks, you know, banging myself around the kitchen, kind of coming back to my computer and thinking, I'm insane. I can't pull my thoughts together. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I realized people have said to me, Kathy Jones, you, you are so funny when I was sick and I used to watch Cogco and you are my favorite. And people have said, like, I've had this job for all these years where people shout across the fucking parking lot at me. I love you. Yep. Like, what the fuck? I mean, somewhere, I just must have been fucking, I know I must have been a good person at some point. You know, we all fuck up and we've all fucked up and I've been aggressive and I've been vicious and I've had so many, you know, Mm -hmm. I've had so much pain that I've held and been able to let, let go of, but I've also had so many blessings. And so comedy has been really good to me. And made me be able to be good to other people. So thank God for that. Totally. But I don't know if I, well, I don't want to have to do, like, I don't know, like, I'm not really like on the career path of like becoming, you know, I don't think, I think like one time a psychic told me that they saw my star as being kind of rusty, a kind of a tin star that was hanging on the dressing room door. It wasn't a big shiny star. It was kind of this rinky dink kind of jalopy kind of fame where I kind of do, 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 you know, kind of go along and one of my tires blows out, but you know, I'm still doing it and I'm not a really big star. Like I'm never going to be, you know, like big, big, you know? Right. Like, yeah. 
Yeah, and, well, and I think part of that too is probably just like being in Canada, right? You know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the only place where you you've been on TV twenty seven years and you have to wear a fucking name tag when you go to a gathering. <laughs> <laughs> well, to Canada, yeah, um, yeah. You know, I think, and it, it, it's funny too that you mentioned that because that's not like dissimilar from my own path. It's and 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 I I certainly don't have um, you know, like not near as many people know who the fuck I am, right? But I do occasionally get that, you know, stop in the in the parking lot or, you know, I, yeah. I, I saw your show, I really liked it. So 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 yeah. if if nothing else, if fucking laughter can help people feel better, then I then I think it's worth it. Yeah. And I just love the way that you are a, a reincarnated beatnik, you know, that that you are from the beat generation, even though you're fucking here now. You know what I mean? You're obviously you obviously have your last, your last life and, and your connection has the roots of those kind of writers as well. And, yeah. and, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, you're obviously, like, Neil Cassidy. Cause, you know what I mean? Like, you're one of those people. Well, thank you. Yeah. And it's funny because I do, um, I'm not real wild, believe it or not, about a lot of that, like, Kerouac stuff. But, but I, 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 I love um, the jazz from that era. And yeah, I, and yeah. I, I love films from that era, and I. But yeah, in terms of like the literature, I tend to go for like um, you know, like the the Dostoevsky, the the like the deep soul, like Russian novel kind of right. thing. And I, but I could totally see how um, you know, like my 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 sense of uh, fashion oh, and, and it's, the way it's I express the jazz myself. that comes out in your writing. You're you're like I have that kind of jazz jazz writing as well. Jazz jazz jamming as well like talking i like to you know it's got that kind of rhythm like you have that when you write and i really like it do you know what was uh, and again talk about myself get uh, distracted here but i i i did i did most of a king's degree like in uh contemporary studies and 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 so heavy philosophy stuff but the most influential thing at all was this professor who's dead now and her name is uh peggy was peggy heller and I, I was writing on my paper and it was like, Hegel said this and Hegel said, and, and then, and then she just like wrote the sentences a different way. And she was like, try, try this. It sounds better. And I was like, Oh fuck. Yeah, you're right. It does sound better. And it, it never, it wasn't even a conversation. But then ever since then, when I was like 19 or whatever, I was like, I've really got to pay attention to how everything I write sounds that and and that wow. was that, like that like those few sentences were like the the most influential thing from my my college years yeah oh my god i love it because i have gone to school not at all and the, i'm doing this writing course and i'm it's my first night at this writing course like four weeks ago and this woman has overwritten this piece like clunkety clunk clunk so <laughs> yeah, much of course and i was like and the woman said okay that's your first draft so and i was like merciful christ you can you can just clunk it out kathy write the fucking you know clunky not very good part where he leaves the tennis court and he goes home you can write that shit it doesn't have to be fucking poetry i have learned not like you going to school like that and having an influential teacher is fucking precious yeah and it was it was just quick too like what would have been meaningful meaningless probably to like 99 percent of the people that got that just that one little nugget just changed everything for me that's and beautiful so um i got just a couple more here um what advice would you have for the you know young aspiring co- i don't know i'm somewhere in the middle of that now because I, I guess i'm i'll be 37 this year so like young aspiring comics or people who who want to get into show business around what what would like uh, other than like maybe don't do it what, what would you say to them <laughs> oh my god you know like what one thing is that that people tend to i think sometimes we think that that there's something more interesting about somebody else's story and i think that where what wherever we come from is worth like sharing the story of and i i mean i i don't know what i would do if i if like if i didn't connect with people karmically like we were dropped into the same field together and kind of like you know, I don't know how I would have been able to 
break into the business. It's a, I have friends who are like, you know, just hanging by a thread because the world is not conducive to like, you know, in the seventies when Trudeau was the, when Pierre Trudeau was the prime minister, they used to give young people grants. It was the same in England. I heard this guy, Alexi Sales, doing an interview where he said in the 70s before Thatcher, it was, there was this, these governments that used to give, like they were inspiring youth to do all this stuff. You could get a grant to go to, you know, go around and, and check out all the islands in the mm. South Pacific. You know, wow. you could get a grant for fucking anything. We used to have a joke where me and me and Di- we had a sketch where Diane and I were around the bay in Newfoundland, and the two drunks from the town say, "What are you doing here? What are you doing?" And we said, "We got a grant. We got a youth grant." And he goes, "Oh, you got to be young to get a youth grant." Anyway, we 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 like, you know, I don't know what I would say because there needs to be more emphasis on things that people can do like that artists can come together and jam and fucking you know create together and like i wish there was more of that i think getting together with your friends seems to really work for like people like hello city and stuff where they have each other you know but if you're you know if if you're a loner and you want to do it i mean so don't be don't, me, folks. <laughs> like that's not a good idea. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, it's hard. I mean, I, what would you say, Josh? What would you say? Because you're from now. You're more from now. Right. Okay. So, so generation. Um. And and I would also say that I I haven't been um successful in terms of like you know making a living. Right. So, but but I but I think I have been successful in and I I don't really do comedy that much anymore. But you know I do this podcast now. Thanks to the very generous uh, 1942 who's sticking with us uh, recording this. And, you know, I, I've done like an illustrated poetry show that had a harpist company and I'm, you know, making a film now on disability and romance. And, and you talk about um, the grants. I, I've got small ones from uh, Arts Nova Scotia to make these Pro- projects possible at least right so so i've got a little like emphasis and onus and recognition for what that what i do is worth doing um right. but 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 i guess i guess like what i would say is just like um don't don't be afraid to be yourself i mean but at the same time pay attention to audiences too because if if your shit's too weird and it's not landing uh then you know it's it might not be that good but if if you're just if you're completely pandering, then you don't have much of a soul. So, so, and, and I, I, I guess, um, just try to do your best work possible and, and maybe don't worry about like the, the financial stuff so much. I, that, that's the only thing I could, I could, from where my vantage point anyway. Yeah. Like I, I feel like if I didn't get carried, I, I, I don't know how I would have, you know, done it. And I feel like, you know, people have to be, you know, they need those people who are willing to do the the money stuff and the grant stuff or, you know, figuring out grants and stuff. Like, I have friends who are artists that are, are like dancers and stuff. My friend, she applies for, every time I'm talking to her, she's applying for a grant, applying for a grant, applying for a grant, applying for a grant. And, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's fucking, my daughter says, She's really glad that she's going to get this two thousand dollars from the government for getting laid off because it really is sort of more than she gets when she works. Wow! Yeah, is 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 reachability being that skimpy? Or like, oh no, not reach, oh, not reachability. Not, not, not my other Mara, daughter, yeah, Mara, yeah. She, it's just that she, you know, she works a forty hour week at a at a retail job, and then she, she's, you know, she's going to, and she's an artist, but she's going to yeah. probably get a little bit from the government. For these, for this thing, gosh, I don't know what it would be like to be a young person right now. Like I fucking what? Except for that, they're sort of they feel like they're a little bit more immune to the virus, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, no, like, and that's like, like I, I mean, you know, and I'm obviously like a little bit compromised with CP, but I, you know, I don't have breathing problems and things like that. So, so I, so I feel, you know, at, at, you know, 36 and a half, if I, if I caught, you know, knock on wood, I would probably survive this, but you know, you can't, you right, can't know right. for sure. Um, yeah. But if you do, would you please let me know? Because, uh, I I have a bunch of like input from my friend about how to, but in the meantime, make sure you get a lot of vitamin C right now, please. C C is the key, eh? C D A. I'll just send you a message and see if you can. Like zinc is really important. Okay, and zinc. are you are you um, you got your you got your and you get to turn off your. Do you have a cell phone? No, um, but I'm on my like twelve year old computer uh, quite a lot. Uh huh. That's my well, main good. thing. Yeah. 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 And and uh, I do uh, I do I do C and D and magnesium daily. Those. Are oh, really, yeah. that's really good. Really good. Yeah. So. Um, because the magnesium, I don't know. There's something that happens with the calcium from from electromagnetic fields, non-native electromagnetic fields, and we do need that magnesium for sure. Um. So yeah. So. Listen, I also got an amazing sleep formula from this woman. Oh, yeah. And I, and I thought, oh, I'll just try a sleep formula. I fucking took one the night before last, and I was sort of getting a sore throat and thought, I'm going to get COVID, and I started doing all my stuff. Yeah. I did, I did her, her sleep formula, and I woke up the next day, and I was like, whoops, I just slept the whole night. It happened again another night. It was just like super wonderful formula she's put together, and it's not the typical valerian or anything it's right. it's like passion flower and and you know i don't know what the Some, fuck you put in there you can't pronounce and yeah, yeah yeah things you can't pronounce yeah anyways but i, I have it if you ever go like uh oh gotta get some sleep yeah i, I might, always I, you probably have lots of sources i might be inclined i mean i'm on like i'm on pretty strong pills right now so i'm a little bit like concerned about what might counteract or whatever but but uh yeah uh, yeah yeah i get that i get that if things get bad i definitely might think so and i think i think this is a a good a good one for like all of us and and um right now um what what would be some advice you would have for like people who are suffering and what, and what helps you personally feel better in, in times of trouble? Well, there was one favorite, favorite book that wasn't a Buddhist book that I found about five years ago called the tool by Phil Stutz and Barry Michaels. And there was these five tools and one really important exercise that I did was, uh, it's called, it was a, an exercise where you, you wrote, down all of the horrible things about you that was just unbearable and embarrassing and uh and then you drew a picture of that aspect of you uh the way that you feel when you're feeling like that and then you when you're about to step on stage or into a situation where you're very uncomfortable you kind of look over to the right and you see that embarrassing stupid petty faced out weird aggressive part of you that is really stupid and everything and you look at her and you say come on and you say here we go and you you say you're coming with me and like you know you bring the parts of you that you're embarrassed about you bring them with you to into the room so that you're not because what happens is when you accept yourself no one can reject you you are the authority in the situation You're not giving anybody like, I hope you like me. It's like, I already like me. Let's just see how this goes here for you guys. But I've already accepted myself. I'm not trying to put the part of me that I'm embarrassed about behind my back and put some kind of fake front on. It's really important to achieve acceptance. It And it's very important not to blame in any way. Blame toxifies the situation. One ounce, one quarter ounce of blame poisons the fucking soup and it's not going to work there's no blame to be fucking put anywhere i mean there's things that happen and people have fucked up but actually the mi- the minute you apply blame then you just step off the i'm gonna do you know you just say you know like people say things like oh i don't know there's no work in this town anyway because the cbc is a fucking ass. It's like just stop for a fucking second and give thanks like that book has brilliant things like saying things, five things you're grateful for. Just 
brings your mind up out of that lower depth and re re it changes your brain. Like your brain, if you say, I am grateful that I sleep in a warm bed, I'm grateful that I have hot water, I'm grateful that I have thick hair, I'm grateful that I can see, you know, I'm grateful that I can hear, I'm so grateful that I know my name today. Like everything that you fucking say, your brain hears you when you say it out loud. There's things you can do to shift what's happening in your brain. You can let go and like go, all right, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole about this. And then people who are really pissing you off, you can care bear them some major love. It's like a trick. There's all kinds of tricks to shift things. You know, that's what I would say is like, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, be grateful. Gratitude is powerful. And also do not ever say negative things like I'm really broke. I never get a break. Nobody around here gives me fucking don't let the magic beings hear you saying negative things because they will jump and say, yes, you're right. Nobody likes you and it's never going to work out. You fucking have to say, I always have more than enough. Money comes to me from unexpected sources. I'm just lucky, I guess. Love now enters my life. I have a car that somebody gave me. Like, you just make up shit. And right. there's this guy, Joe Dispenza. I've got this book called oh, yeah, Becoming Supernatural. You have him? I, I, well, I know anyway, of him, at least, yeah. He's not. He's over the top. And I can't really read that much. It's too big a book for me. But, like, he changed. He had a really severe. He got run over by a truck when he was on a bike. And they were going to do something really weird to his entire spine. And as he was lying there thinking oh, about yeah, it, yeah, 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 he changed everything in his body with his mind because of the injury. He healed himself, and he fucking he's he's onto this thing. And unfortunately, the only time I get this kind of supernatural kind of like, yeah, man, feeling is when I first get high on this wonderful weed. This guy had a magoosh grows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's this kind of weed that he grows that, like, I always want to say it in a Jamaican accent, but. Like, it's like the heart of the man is in the herb, you know? And it's like the man's heart is in his herb. You and got to herb... smoke the heart, man. You got to yes. smoke the heart. <laughs> and so it's like, this guy's weed is like beautiful. You don't get a hangover from it. You don't get nasty. You don't get unhappy. You don't have a down from it. You have a tiny amount and at the right time, like every three or four days. And you get this beautiful trip. And he also has brownies that are just they're like a mushroom trip these brownies are like mushrooms like you and the other person who's done mushrooms like look for each other and go oh there you are man like it's just brownies with weed in them but you're so happy but anyways like there's there's things that you can apply that really work that over the years i've you know done like uh for my depression i did eye movement desensitization and reprocessing which is called emdr which is brilliant because you don't apply a lot of discussion. You apply a lot of kind of right brain, left brain stimulation with a sound or an image. And then you kind of dig down into something that you've taken for granted and run the same neurological pathway about all your life, which is fucking you up. Like my mm -hmm. mother sent me to the priest when I was seven to tell the priest that I was impure because I'd taken my clothes off with my friend. And then when I did it in EMDR, I went, oh, <gasps> And the therapist goes, what? And I go, well, my mother was such a Catholic that she was actually thinking that she was saving my soul. And therefore, my mother didn't fuck me over. She loved me and she tried to save me. And then my whole life, I walk into a room now, not the person whose mother fucked him over by sending him to the priest. I walk into the room as a person whose mother loved him very much. And, and so when you change your storyline, you change your life. And there's a way around a lot of neurosis. There's a way to to you never give up because your brain is plastic and you never give up on it yeah no i i i think um i think that's a wonderful uh way way to look at things and you know like like looking at it and going um yeah you know your your mom shouldn't have made you feel bad about doing something that was very natural however her her intentions behind what she was doing like you said was very good and she was trying to save you she wasn't like like the like and i think 
I think that's really, and what you were talking earlier in the answer about like your self-confidence, you know, like don't walk into a room thinking I'm no, like, you know, all, already, you know, kind of believe in yourself and, and, and yeah, I'm no, yeah. no, cause that's going to like, like that, like the, one of those old sayings, like, um, I don't, I don't know if, I, I think other people can love you anyway, but, but if, um, if you love yourself, that's going to open yourself up to deeper you know, and, and more meaningful love from, from others. And, um, yeah, I mean, I thought about this last night, like I've never had a boyfriend that was actually my, you know, equal, like somebody who was creative and had a, wrote a book or, you know, right. did, uh, Tom, Tom was a musician and a great writer and stuff, but like he had a whole bunch of emotional stuff and I had emotional stuff. I was like, I thought to myself, wow, imagine if I could imagine myself into actually finally having a relationship with someone that I actually look up to and, and appreciate like that. Like I've never done it, but like you said, if you the appreciating yourself and, and accepting yourself, make people magnetize towards you. And when you are secretly unaccepting of yourself and really hard on yourself, you spend a lot of time alone. And that's been the story of my life is that I have secretly been in a fight with myself and therefore people don't know what to do about it, so they can hang out with me mm-hmm. and be happy because they're because they they sort of, you know nobody if nobody's with you sometimes they don't want to be with you and it's not a big deal it's just that they don't want to be with you because you don't really want to be with you and the more you want to be with you and the more you can just be nice to yourself about all your imperfect stuff then the more people are going like I want to hang out with that person yep yep to- totally and. And I also think too, like like um, the the spin that you put on, like the perspective you put on things, is is so tremendously helpful. Because like when you were talking earlier about you know that stuff, oh, if you have that attitude, oh, I'll never get a break, da da da, this and that. And 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 I fall into that trap sometimes, totally. However, if I take a step back and I actually look at it objectively. And I go, well, you know what? Yes, uh, by Western standards, I, I am extremely poor by, by Western standards. But I, you know, I have a wonderful family for the most part and, and wonderful friends. And I got enough to get by. I, I got a nice apartment. Um, my my health problems that I do have, are they're only, they're chronic, but they're not critical. You know, I'm not, not dying. I'm, I'm, I'm young, you know, like, they're like, so, yep. so really like when you really boil it down to it, I, I really don't have anything to worry about, you know, like, so, yeah. so, so that's, that's what I, what I think that, that people can. That's, can that's take. really beautiful. It's really like, you know, and you know, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. Like you're, you're counting your blessings and you're fucking switching your brain over to like appreciation instead of fear. Yep. Like fear, this is not enough. I'm not doing good enough. Like who said that? What do you, you know, and then you got a question like, Hey, wait a minute. Who was that? Why are you saying that? Like, who is this? Yep. Because they say, they say that when you are, when you believe that stuff is just happening to you and you don't take responsibility for anything, like, I've had friends that, you know, 30 people can tell you you're an asshole and you're like, I can't believe those 30 people are so stupid. It's like, wait a minute, when 30 people say it, bud, it could be true. Why are you being, you know, why are you not taking responsibility like for your part in things? You have to own it. You have to be accountable. One of the things that saved my relationship with my kids is that I've gone, guys, I'm fucking up, but I'm going to work on it and I'll pay for your therapist. (laughs) <laughs> yeah no and and i think like that's that's really like because even like i i'm not gonna get into it too deep but just talking about how i was estranged from my father and stuff if if all if he had, if he comes to me at any point in my life and says you know what some shit went down but you know i'm working on it it wouldn't be a problem you know what i mean like i say yes you have a chance and you know we can try to be cool and whatever but 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 yeah like you you've got to you you've, you've got to own your own your mistakes i think i think everybody should and and you know and it's very painful that some people never go there but like i used to always like dwell on the part about my friend where they couldn't let go of this stuff and but actually then i have to go okay maybe that person is not perfect and couldn't own their stuff at the same time you know like you have to be compassionate for yeah. people, even not just the good people or the suffering people, but the people who have 
stubborn attitudes who can't really take responsibility for their shit. Having compassion, like they say, you know, like, you know, everyone, everyone, you have to be grateful to everyone, everyone, like everyone, even, you know, and like imagine all those Tibetan people that got thrown into jail for 25 years when, yep. you know, and then they're trying to be compassionate to their captors and stuff. It's like, you know, when Jesus Christ, did you see that case where that guy went in and beat this lady to shit and he was stoned on, I think it was mushrooms, but he got off. And I'm thinking, look at all those people that are in jail who were absolutely poised, polluted, drunk when they murdered somebody. And they had a miserable life. And yeah. they turned out to be an addict because they were so tortured in their early life. And they don't get that minute where someone says, all right, listen, you were drunk and you've never been loved. So how about we put you in a program? where we're not going to give you 35 years in jail and treat you like a piece of shit every day. You know, how about some of that? Yeah. That'd be yeah, totally. Like, I think, I think that's really important. Um, compassion for everybody, you know, like imagine if, you know, we could, we could love, have love for the devil even, you know, and, and just, uh, I wonder what, you know, you gotta feel sorry for the devil. Cause the devil was just like, what, you know, being really good was taken. So he had no choice. Yeah. <laughs> it would be like, it's so, really hard being the devil. Nobody likes you. Somebody had to occupy that opposite pole, right? Yeah, I guess. But, you know, it's like it's like there's a, there's a philosophy in 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 Vajrayana of like, all right, I'll take the fall. I'll say the stupid thing. I'll be the asshole here because it's interesting and it's you know it's an interesting kind of like we all want to be good, but sometimes you know it's like why not why not just say something really fucking provocative and see what happens, you know. Yeah, but totally. the chips fall where they may. Mm -hmm. Um, I just have uh one one more to finish this off, and I th I think I mentioned this on the on the Facebook chat. This is how I finish off every interview. Um, what 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 do you think the meaning of life is? I don't know if there's a meaning as much as a dilemma. I don't think there's a meaning. Like, I don't think, I think men look for the meaning. Okay. And while men are busy looking for the meaning, women are saying, all right, we're here. We might as well, make, somebody better make soup. Okay. Like, so, so what's, what's the dilemma then? The dilemma is, um, you know, how do you, how do you let go of, pushing away what you don't want and drawing in what you want, how can you be present in your life without prejudice towards things going well for you and wanting things to not go badly for yourself so that you try to create situations where it works out for you all the time, which causes a lot of suffering. Right. So kind of like, how can you be a good person without being completely self-interested? Yes. Like, ha, like uh, I think, you know, they say that all, all the joy in life comes from, you know, you don't want to be an idiot. You got to have boundaries. Right. But, you know, like we do have to be, you know, I, I think the dilemma of life is how do we, how do we, become how do we accept acceptance We're, we've been talking about acceptance a lot like like life is just it i think it's an illusion i think it's a like for example i have this joke where i'm on a date with this guy and i get high and i go you know the past is gone and the pre and and the future is not here yet and we live we're really we only have the present moment and actually the present moment can be broken down into um, such small increments that when the arising and the existing and the falling away of the m m microscopic, you know, measurement of a, of, a, of a millisecond, there's actually no present moment either because there's no graspable present because it's constantly turning into the past and it's not really the present future yet. So there's really no present because actually, you know, time is kind of a bullshit concept. And then I have, the guy says, I don't know enough about it, you know? 
but like I really feel like it you you think life is kind of a dream and that we we think it's real that we constantly think that we're we're separate and that this is this is actually happening and actually it's kind of a vibrational kind of you know experience that seems solid the belief in a in a solid self seems to be a real trap and and causes all the problems whereas if we realize that we're not that solid we could let go of defending ourselves and you know creating a, a, a an us and them situation or self and other if we could really become like have ultimate equanimity where there was you know just this quality of space they say that the the mind has two qualities one is is busy like the brain just the mind thinks like things hey what i wonder if there's any turkey in the fridge who mm-hmm. framed that picture oh my god i'm cold your brain is thinking and then there's another quality of your brain that's the absolute truth about your mind is that it's just like the sky that's um that's really beautiful and i think i'm just gonna and uh thank thanks a bunch for doing this um it's well, been really it really is fun thank can you I, so much can I, i'm just gonna do the outro uh real quick okay um, go ahead sure. folks she's been kathy jones i've been josh dunn this has been our milestone episode gimpin ain't easy because it ain't episode number 25 and remember like i tells you every time especially when you're feeling low look yourself in the mirror give yourself that rick flair And tell yourself, I am the greatest of all time. Good night, everybody.